Praise God. It's a great day. We have guests here visiting with us. It's great to have David, Ruth, and Fern here. It's great to have Jack and Dee back there who are not so much guests as just occasional attenders, and we're happy to have them back. And I see Nydia Ferguson over here. She's escaped the islands to come and visit us here. So, praise God. It's good to see you. How's John? Good. Tell him we missed him. So, it's great to see you here. Okay, there may be others. If you want to get recognized, please raise your hand and maybe I'll notice you. But uh, those lights are hard. Anyway, friends, it's great to be in the house of the Lord. It's great to be with you today. The Lord gave me a message which is peculiar. And I guess all I can say is I feel like the Lord wants us to take a journey today through the Gospels, through actually a lot of the Old Testament. And I have to say that, you know, you know who I am, so I'm not all that great or all that smart, but I happen to know that there are people in the world that God has gifted with great talents, great scholastic abilities, and one of them, one of them was Dr. Michael Heiser. He died in March, but, so he's home with the Lord, but the good news is he left a lot of books that he wrote, and he left a lot of YouTube teachings, and I commend him to anybody who is interested in going further with the Lord. He brings uh, insight and understanding to the Old Testament because he's reading it and he's pray, prayerfully studying it and he understands the context in which it was written. You know, the difficulty that we have frequently is that we're living in 2023, but some guy wrote a book, you know, 3,500 years ago and he lived in a completely different time with different everything. You know, they didn't open up their cool Google flip phone and say, Google, what's the capital of Iran? You know, and it just tells you to run. You know, they didn't have those kinds of things. As a matter of fact, they pretty much had to carry their information around in their noggin. They may have been smarter than us and certainly more retentive, but they didn't have the things that we have and we don't live the way they did. So understanding the Word of God in the context in which it was written is tricky because we're not living in those times and in those ways. So I thank God for people like Michael Heiser and others who have taken the time, who have devoted themselves to understanding the Word of God from the perspective of the people who were concurrent with its writing. You know, the Bible is not the only document that was written 3,500 years ago. There's lots of other things. Some of them have survived and come down to us today. So we have the ability to read contemporary writings and understand the thought processes or the understanding of the people of that era. So when we read, if we study as he did, as I'm doing, then we begin to understand the word as it was intended by the author as opposed to us bringing whatever in our lives to it today and trying to impute to the word our understanding from a different era with a completely different ethos. So, having said that, I want to jump in. And as is my custom, I am always late with these things, so I did not get the verses to anybody to put them on the screen, so I apologize to you. You're just going to have to jump into the Bible if you want to read these yourself. We're going to start... In Genesis chapter 6, verses 1, and four, 1 through 4. One of the things about Michael Heiser was that he was attracted to the weird stuff, is, what he put, has, is how he put it. He was attracted to the weird stuff in the Bible. And you know, the Bible has a lot of weird stuff in it. So there was a lot for him to dig into. And we're going to start with one of those weird things. Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Now it came about when mankind began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of mankind, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Okay, this is a strange passage. 
It is a strange story. The sons of God sought out the daughters of mankind and had children with them. This is a very odd story to our ears and raises many questions. For example, maybe the first question is, who were the sons of God? They were the Elohim, or holy ones. So John 3.16 says that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. It puts him on a different plane from any other being because he was not created. He is God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. We serve a triune God. However, God has many created beings. We are some of them. But he has others. You know, people know about angels. Sadly, we know about demons. We know about principalities and powers, things like that that are referred to in the Word and that sometimes people have experienced, experienced with in this world. You know, I bet if I ask for a show of hands, there's people in this room that have dealt with either demons or angels or maybe both. It happens, you know. Um, <clears throat> But one of the things that God did was he created the sons of God. These were powerful entities who were angelic beings, I guess you could say, and they were created by God and were the heavenly counsel of God. You know, there's a place in uh, uh, First Kings, I believe it is, where God confers with the heavenly counsel. I think it's First Kings 21, but I could be wrong. And, and He confers with his heavenly counsel. It's written down. And he says, who will go and uh, torment Saul? And one of the counsel steps forward and says, I'll do it. And uh, is dispatched to, to bring torment to Saul, who was a disobedient king. That's just one example of several in the Bible where we find out about these sons of God. Well, these particular sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 did something they were not supposed to do. They looked upon the daughters of men, coveted them, and had relations with them. And from them was produced another race, the Nephilim. They were giants. They were um, supernaturally powered. And from them, the Greeks came up with the idea of the demigods. Um, But I tell you, Greek mythology is nothing but a uh, distortion of what God's word says. So when you read Greek mythology, what you're actually reading is Jewish history filtered through a pagan's understanding. It's quite an interesting take. In Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9, says, When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of mankind or the sons of God, is what it says in the Septuagint, and the Qumran scrolls, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they refer to not the sons of mankind, but the sons of God. I put it to you that I believe that's the older and more accurate translation, the sons of God. So, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of God, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. The nations that are referred to in this passage here are actually identified in Genesis chapters 10 and 11. There were 70 nations that are identified there. Interestingly, what it also said and what we just read I know it's hard to take all this in when I'm just spewed it out here. It says, he set the boundaries of the peoples or established the nations of the earth according to the number of the sons of Israel. The thing about the Bible is it's just, it's astonishing how this piece ties in with that piece and suddenly you have a hole that's just, you never imagined was there. Genesis 46, 27 says, and the sons of Joseph who were who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the people of the house of Jacob, or Israel, who came to Egypt were 70. From this we know, it's cool, because if you look in Genesis 10 and 11, and you count up all the generations that are there, each of them responsible for the establishment of a nation. 
there are 70 of them. And here we see, and of course in Deuteronomy it said that, what? According to the number of the sons of Israel, the boundaries of the people are set according to the number of the sons of Israel. Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, was Israel. God gave him that name. And when he went to Egypt, there were 70 sons of Israel. The one thing ties to the other, and we see how consistent the Word of God is in these weird ways, you know. I hear people say sometimes, well, you know, the Bible's an old thing, it was written by people, and, you know, it's got a lot of in, inconsistencies in it and inaccuracies and stuff. And I just smile, because I recognize I'm dealing with an idiot. And uh, so the truth is, the Bible is the most astonishing work ever written, and the consistency with which God has brought together his word and his truths is astounding. When you consider that it was, in fact, written by different individuals inspired by God and over centuries. They weren't even all at the same time, and yet it beautifully corresponds. It beautifully connects. And so here we have the sons of Israel are 70, the nations that God established in Genesis 10 and 11 are numbered 70. An important point, by the way, is that the sons of God were set over these nations. There was one son of God for each nation. We have an example of this, or uh, a re revelation of this, in Daniel 10, verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was standing in my way for 21 days, then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. You know, Daniel was fasting and praying, seeking the Lord about, Lord, when will the captivity of, the, of your people in Babylon be, be completed? He was fasting and praying, seeking the Lord earnestly. And this angel appears to him after 21 days and says, Hey, from the minute you started praying, I was sent to give you an answer because you were much beloved by God. However, the prince of Persia, that is, the son of God who was in authority, appointed by God to be in authority over the nation of Persia, contended with me and was keeping me from you. Daniel persisted in prayer. The angel persisted in seeking to get through and finally called upon Michael, the archangel, to help him so that he could get through with the message from God. I don't, you know, God's God. He could have just gone, boom and the angel would be there, and, and the prince of Persia would be non-existent anymore. But that's not the way God has chosen to work. He's established a system and an order, and he is working through it to our, his glory and to our blessing. Amen. So there we see an example of these princes that were set over the nations. Notice, if you will, if, when you go and read Genesis 10 and 11, following up with this. I just don't have time to cover all of this. Um, this is the Reader's Digest version of a big message. Um, if you go and read Genesis 10 and 11, you will find that those 70 nations, they covered the known earth at that time. What they don't include, however, is the nation of Israel. There's a reason for that. God has declared that the nation of Israel was his inheritance and all those other nations were given unto the sons of God. The sons of God, unfortunately, um, have not done what they were expected to do. They have fallen. They have hated mankind. They've lusted after our standing and position before God. And as a result of that, they sinned. Some of them sinned by going into the daughters of mankind and bearing children that were those Nephilim I was talking about. Those, those sons of God, they have been paying a terrible price for thousands of years. This is what it says in Jude, verses 6 and 7. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper dwelling place. These he has kept in eternal restraints under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these angels, indulged in the sexual perversion and went after strange flesh, 
are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So some of the sons of God have been and remain in prison for thousands of years now, while others are still doing the work of their leader, Satan, here on the earth. Note also Jude's condemnation of sexual perversion and going after strange flesh. I believe that these devils, in their efforts to pollute the bloodlines of mankind, also taught fallen men to pursue sexual perversion and strange flesh. One might ask, why would demon princes want to pollute the bloodlines of mankind? Why would they care one way or the other? It's as simple as this. These sons of God know who Jesus is. They know the plan. They just didn't know the details of it, but they understood that he was the only begotten son of God. <clears throat> they know what he was sent to do, and they tried to corrupt the bloodlines of mankind with their own foul offspring, the Nephilim. The, d- the deal here was they knew a savior was coming. They can't stop that. You know, I mean, they just, they just can't. God's God, and he's going to do what God wants to do. Amen? They also know the judgment that's upon them. So, what to do? What to do? They can't stop the judgment either. But you know what they can do? They can delay and delay and delay and they can extend for thousands of years, if possible, the judgment of God. The eventual day of reckoning will come, but they seek to deceive mankind and to delay that judgment from ever arriving. In the same way, they sought to delay the coming of the Messiah. If they could pollute the bloodlines, then the Holy One of Israel would himself be corrupted. But in fact, they failed. Praise God. In Psalm 82, God prophesies this eternal judgment upon the sons of God because they rebelled against his intended plan. You know, they hated us. Why do they hate us? You may look in the mirror and say, I remember when I half looked halfway decent, and now I just look old and terrible. You know, I have that conversation with myself pretty often, you know. I remember when women used to, like, hit on me, and, you know, not them, you know, not that I was responding. I'm just saying it was nice. It was flattering to have that. It's been a while since that happened, you know what I'm saying, Jim? So, uh, anyway, we, we have suffered the, the devastation of time. But... Here's the thing. According to God's word, you're not just you. You are made in the image of God. God's creation looks on humankind and doesn't say, there's a pretty one, there's an ugly one. They look upon humankind and say, they are made in the image of the Father. We have a peculiar place, a standing before God in all of his creation. It's unique. We have been made in the image of God. He has declared, this is very cool, he has declared that upon the judgment, those who accepted Jesus as their Savior, who are with him, their sins have been washed away. There is no iniquity found in them. God looks at them and says, oh, covered by the blood. Jesus says, yes, Daddy, that's one of mine. And sit over here on my right side. You know, what's the right side? That's the side of power and authority in scripture. We're being welcomed into the house of God. We're being welcomed to the very throne room and seated with our Savior Jesus at the throne of God. Nobody else that I can find in scripture gets this position. Just those who have received Jesus as their Savior. Now that's a lot of people, but still in all, it's a miracle given all of the created beings that God has made. We know there's cherubim and seraphim and there's angels and there's authorities and powers and principalities, all these things that God has ordained. And some of them are really strange to our eyes and maybe we're strange to them. But what I know is that none of them 
were declared to be made in the image of God. Only us. 1 Corinthians 6, 3 says, Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more are the matters of this life? Brothers and sisters, we are inheriting a place with Jesus that's in authority over God's creation. Some of that we see today. If you encounter somebody who is some demon-possessed lunatic and you cast the demons out of them in the name of Jesus, you're seeing or exercising the authority of God in this world, in the here and now. But that is a mere inkling, a just a, a drop of what God's authority and power and blessing is for his people. So anyway, the sons of God, they have, unfortunately stepped out of line, they've violated God's directions, they've resented us, and have sought to hurt us and destroy us, and the world is a fallen place. They've led the people of this earth into great sin and rebellion, and as a result, this earth has suffered. It has suffered now for thousands of years. God said in Psalm 82, verses 1 through 7, God takes his position in his assembly. He judges in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked, Selah? Vindicate the weak and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Brothers and sisters, that's us. That's the people of this world. Save them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like one of the princes. The sons of God, who were created as these regal beings, the uh, servants of the Most High, have so uh, crossed the uh, plans of God that it says here, all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like one of the princes. Their eternal status has been taken from them. They are defeated. And the day is coming, the day of judgment. We know where that is. It's in it's spoken of and clearly in Revelation chapter 20, they'll be cast into the abyss eternally. Fire and brimstone. Hallelujah. That'll be their lot. Hallelujah. I have many times asked the Lord, please let me have one hand on that devil when he's thrown into the, into the abyss. You know, I mean, people think I'm silly. I mean it with every fiber of my being. He has done terrible things to me and to you and to our brothers and sisters throughout the ages. I, you know, I may be presuming too much, but I have asked the Lord, just let me get one hand on him as he's tossed in there. What a joy. So, that'll be the day when God's wrath is poured out and and is completed. It's completely spent. And from then on, these once exalted, now ugly, fallen, craven creatures will be no more. That passage, by the way, is pretty cool. Let me just read it to you. I was going to cut it out, but it's kind of neat. So let's just read it. In Revelation chapter 20, it says, I'm sorry. I forgot. I wanted to read you something else. This is also from Revelation. It's hard for me to keep these things in order. Consider the source here. So Revelation 9 is where we find out something cool. It turns out all those sons of God that have been kept in darkness for eons now, in utter darkness in this abyss, this place of the dead, they're still alive. They've just been imprisoned. And in Revelation chapter 9, it says, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth. And the key to the shaft of the abyss was given to him. He opened the shaft of the abyss, and smoke ascended out of the shaft 
like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened from the smoke of the shaft. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They, they were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree but only the people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a person. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, and death will flee from them. That's going to be a terrible time. Hope we're not here. The, the appearance of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. These are what used to be the sons of God. They've been imprisoned. And here we see John's attempt to describe these twisted, distorted, perverted, and corrupted beings who were the exalted of God. It says, On their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like human faces. They had hair like the hair of women. And their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots, of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings. And in their tails is their power to hurt people for five months. Whoa. They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in the Greek, he, is the, he has the name Apollyon. That name, either Abaddon or Apollyon, means destruction. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. If that wasn't bad enough, God's planning on lining up even worse things to follow. But here we see that these, uh, these demon lords, if you will, these sons of God, who've been in cap held in captivity for thousands of years, are going to be released for one last rumble. And it's going to be a terrible time. Pray that we're not a part of that. Of course, we have the seal of the Lord on us because we know Jesus is our Savior, right? We've received the seal of the Holy Spirit. And they're not going to attack us, but I just don't want to be here watching that torment of all those people who failed to heed the warnings of the gospel, who failed to receive Jesus as their Savior. Oh, my God, my God. Now, we know, as I was saying from Revelation 20, that a judgment comes, the day of wrath, the day of judgment, and they will finally reap the eternal reward that is theirs. Now, finally, let me turn to my text for today. <laughs> 1 Peter 3, 18 through chapter 4, verse 2. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all time, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in, prison, in, in the spirit, sorry, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. Who are the spirits in prison? The sons of God. The, sons of God the same ones that we've just been talking about, that had went into the daughters of earth and, and had these corrupted offspring, the Nephilim, and have been bound for thousands of years. They, Jesus went to them. Can you imagine this? Jesus dies. He's put in that tomb. And he went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. I don't think Jesus went down there and was telling them about salvation. Because, in point of fact, they had no salvation. Judgment had been rendered upon them. No. I can well imagine it going something like this. Jesus goes right there into hell itself, the place of the dead. Here are these sons of God, these wicked, wicked sons of God. And they greet him, and they razz him, and they say, Ha ha ha! You failed! Look, you're down here like, just like us. Can you imagine that? wouldn't that be their response? They've been tormented all this time, and here he is now, right there with them, stuck in this place of the dead. But Jesus had a proclamation to make. And that proclamation was, you 
will be here tomorrow. I will be raised by the living God and will no longer be in this place. I am the I am. He is God. And as such, he paid the price for you and me. He suffered, he died for what we should have suffered and died for and gave us life, new life in him. We don't have to put up with the lies of the devil. We don't have to put up even with the desires of our own carnality, our own flesh. We can rise above in the power of Almighty God. We can stand against the things of the enemy, and we can see victory. Yes, I said victory today, tomorrow, next week, throughout the course of our lives. Amen? It is a time of victory for us. Jesus Christ is Lord. The world is our it is not the devil's. Jesus has taken authority back from him, and we, the children of God, are alive to the things of God, and we are expected to bring salvation, healing, joy, deliverance to the world and all of its, all of its citizens. The, the devil's grip has been severed. Those who thought they had won were no doubt devastated to find that the the defeat was even worse than they imagined. Praise God. Those who were once disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. I mean, being dunked in water is not going to save you. Chorus, uh, sorry, lost my place. But an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Now, the devil may pop up in your life sometime. He may come to you. This has happened to people. It happened to me, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I've known it to have happened to other people. Sleeping, you wake up in the middle of the night, all of a sudden this creepy, cold, clammy feeling. It's like evil is in the room. And you look down at the foot of the bed, and there's this black shrouded figure hovering there ominously. That would be terrifying. Or not. If you don't know who you are in Christ, that could be pretty scary. And that evil shrouded figure could kind of have their way with you, I suppose. But if you do know that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord, then you also know that those principalities and powers, those authorities, have no authority over you. The proper response to a situation like that, or any number of others where the devil's trying to scare you or frighten you into some, you know, untoward act, the proper response is, oh, it's you. Get out of here in Jesus' name. You have no right to be here. You're a trespasser, and I command you to leave right now in Jesus' name. And here's what will happen. When you declare in the authority of Jesus' name that they have to leave, they will leave. They will probably hesitate for just a second because it will surprise them. And then they'll just fade away, and all that evil and all that gloom just dissipates. The room gets brighter. Everything gets better, you know. The devil, as Peter also said, comes like a roaring lion, seeking who, may, who he may devour. Emphasis on the word like. You know, he isn't a roaring lion. He can't actually devour anybody who's standing in the name of Jesus. All he is, is he is, you ever see those clowns, you know, when you're a kid? Those clowns, you hit them and they fall over and they pop back up and you hit them again, you know, you're a boxing clown. That's what he is for the children of God. Why is he even still around? He's around because we are learning to exercise the authority that we've been given in Christ Jesus. We're learning to take the authority that is ours and to stand as the children of God, princes and princesses in God's kingdom, ruling with authority in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. I get excited when I think about that. Glory. Hallelujah. Isn't that great? So, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh... 
arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because the one who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human lust, but for the will of God. Hallelujah. Six points. One, Jesus went to the abyss and spoke to the prisoners there. No doubt they thought that he was joining them there and that he had lost to their plans for him. Ha! <laughs> Second point, Noah and his family were baptized by their ordeal inside the ark. Surrounded by water for over a year, they were cleansed and became the new sanctified race of God. All of us descended from Noah and his family. The corruption of mankind by the sons of God was purged in the flood, and a new people, lacking the polluted bloodlines of the Nephilim, was founded by God. Three, Noah was saved from a physical threat, a flood. We, through Jesus Christ, have been saved from sin. As we obey his command and are baptized, we signify the change in our lives. A dead spirit is renewed, and the mind of guilt and condemnation is washed clean. No longer to keep us enslaved to the lies of the devil, but to fill our minds with a clean conscience and a grateful heart. Amen. Glory. Number four, Jesus, who suffered and died for us, now has every angel, authority, and power under his feet, under his authority. He is sovereign, and there is nothing, nothing which the devil can do to change that. Number five, if we love Jesus, if we wish to serve him, we too must be prepared to suffer. Jesus, who was innocent, died for us. It is only right that we who are anything but innocent should be prepared to suffer for his sake. However, the suffering is slight while the rewards are great. Amen. Number six, although Peter says that we must arm ourselves against the desires of the flesh and for the will of God, <clears throat> it is God himself who has given us the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the knowledge of his word so that we can put down the flesh and attain the will of God for our lives. He has said, seek the will of God. Seek to, and pursue to do the will of God. But he has also empowered us to do that. If we were left to our own devices, we would soon fall. But we are not left to our own devices. We have been given Jesus' name. We've been given the power of the Holy Spirit. We've been giving the, given the living word. We can soak it in. We can take it in. We, too, can grow in our knowledge and understanding of God's will for our lives, for our ways, for our time and our culture. We, too, can see the world change in our time. Now, you may say, oh, but Tom, I'm just me. I'm just little old me. And I would say, yes, you are. But you are also a child of the living God, and the power of God Almighty flows through you if Jesus Christ is your Savior. Franklin is a mighty man of God. Louis is going to be a mighty man of God because you're turning your life over to Jesus Christ. Are you not, Louis? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Father God, I thank you for these people, your people. I pray your blessings upon them now. Lord God, O oh merciful Father, thank you, thank you, thank you the plans of Satan have failed. You reign supreme, and your blessed name has been given to us. We are your people. Hallelujah! Somebody say amen. amen. We are the people of God. Amen. Father God, may your love, zeal, power, and mercy be poured out upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, if you're here, and you don't know Jesus, everything I said probably sounds crazy. <laughs> there may be some Christians here who think it sounded crazy. And I apologize because, you know, I want to preach three-hour sermons, but they won't let me. So there's just not time to get everything out that I want to say. But if you're here today, if you don't know Jesus, well, come on down. There's no better thing to do in this world than to receive Jesus as your Savior. And if you're here today and you've got burdens in your life, there's worries or troubles in your life, then I just invite you to come forward. There will be people here who will pray with you, who will have the faith, the requisite faith, to pray with you and see change come into your life. Some of it instant, some of it over time, as God wills. But... 
Change will happen today. Don't hold back. If a problem is burdening you and you walk out this door and you kept that problem to yourself and didn't receive Jesus, if you want to reestablish your life with Jesus. Jimmy just pointed out, or if you're here and you just want to rededicate, reestablish your life in Jesus, don't hold back. The devil really wants you to hold back. Don't do that. Come and receive God's blessing for your life.